Hello and welcome to Wednesday Warfare, where I review NXT and AEW Dynamite back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. Well, today's been a big old pile of suck in the wrestling world. In case you haven't heard, many, 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 many wrestlers and officials have received their release slash furlough notice in WWE. And uh, yeah, it's been a real crap day uh, for a lot of wrestlers and their fans and their family and friends and what have you. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it at length here. If you want to hear my detailed thoughts, on the issue. I did a whole ass video about it earlier today. You can check it out right here. But for now, like what you like. Don't be a dick. Let's get right into it. NXT begins the match between Finn Balor and Fabian Eichner of Imperium. Early in the match, Tom Phillips makes a very good point that the battle that Finn Balor is going through to get through these members of Imperium to get to Walter for the UK title, very reminiscent uh, to that of Velveteen Dream doing the same thing with the Undisputed Era and Adam Cole's NXT Championship. Be that as it may, I like this match a lot. I like the strength on display by Eichner here. Marcel Bartel getting involved occasionally, but he gets his near the end. Finn uh, takes them both out hits the coup de grace and the 1916 to win the match. Like I said, solid opener here. Uh, Balor building momentum against Walter whenever that encounter inevitably takes place. We had a recap of the beef between Tegan Knox and Raquel Gonzalez, or as I called the package, Raquel Gonzalez ruins everything in the movie. And then we get another promo from the new women's champion, Charlotte. It's the third different promo that they've cut for her since she won the belt at WrestleMania. In this one, she talks about how she can't wait to tear through the best of the women's division, the best women's division in WWE. And she singles out Mia Yim in particular because she says, you know, Mia Yim was my first NXT opponent all those years ago. And now I want to finally give back to her. Aaliyah taking on Zia Lee up next. A surprising amount of build going into this feud, it turns out. I mean, going back a couple of months ago when Aaliyah was written off with her kayfabe nose injury at the hands of Zia, and then a couple of weeks ago they were supposed to have the follow-up match, and then Zia was jumped from behind by a mystery assailant, and it turns out it was Aaliyah all along. So leading to this match here, uh, Aaliyah with some cheap shots early on, but Zia dominates pretty soon after that. It's a pretty short match. Zaya wins definitively with her spinning uh, kick to the back of Aaliyah's head, and there you have it. Backstage, Matt Riddle's on the phone with Stallion Pete, trying to figure out who his replacement partner is going to be for tonight's tag team title match. Then we go to the first matchup in the Cruiserweight Championship Tournament. Now, due to uncertain times, Jordan Devlin is unable to come to America to defend the championship. He's stuck in Ireland. So they decide to do a two-group tournament to determine a new interim champion. And I'm all in favor of that idea. Idea. Uh, interim champions are a regular occurrence. It's a big reality in MMA and boxing, so it's cool to see wrestling adopt that every once in a while, and this is the perfect opportunity to do something like that. Some great action in this matchup. It's one of my favorites of the night, and I still can't believe the, the lengths some of these guys will go to taking some crazy bumps for nobody. At one point, Tazawa hitting the move that Jerry Lawler called the ramen noodle moonsault. It's actually a rolling senton off the apron, but don't tell him that. In the end, Tazawa hits his giant senton off the top rope in order to win, and not advanced, but he gets a point in the tournament. Still a chance for the people who lose these opening matches to get some points back in these uh, two in this two-group tournament. And speaking of those cruiserweights in the tournament, we get a hype package for the soon-to-debut El Io de Fantasma. I'm really excited to see him in action here, but I was very creeped out by his hype package they showed because they did this effect with like these still images where they'll move like certain parts of the body to give it the impre the, give it the effect of a, of a shot in motion, and it just looked creepy. I, I didn't like it at all. Raquel Gonzalez makes her in-ring debut for NXT taking on Tegan Knox. It's a pretty short and sweet matchup. It begins pretty much dominantly toward Gonzalez, like beating Tegan down repeatedly. Dakota Kai's at ringside on behalf of Raquel, and she gets a shot in as well. That prompts Shotzi Blackheart to come out and make the save, even the odds. And while Raquel's distracted, Tegan rolls her opponent up to win the matchup. And there you go. It seems an alliance has been formed between Tegan and Shotzi. We'll see how long that lasts as they go up against uh, Raquel and uh, Dakota Kai in the very near future. I really enjoyed this next thing here. It was a high package about the North American champion Keith Lee. He talks about his upbringing and how his grandma introduced him to wrestling when he was the age of five. And then at 20 years old, he, he dropped everything to start training to wrestle and how he was basically disowned by his family as a result, how he overcame the odds to get to where he is now. As far as like packing a lot of story into a really tight package, they did a really good job here. Dexter Loomis squashes to Hootie Miles. At least he's getting some considerable airtime this week. Then we get another uh, promo from Adam Cole in his house, and he reminds once again that Velveteen Dream, nor anyone, is worthy of a shot at his championship. He also hypes up uh, Roderick Strong and Bobby Fish for the tag title match later in the night. Then we see Velveteen Dream offering up his rebuttal to Adam Cole. Uh, he spends, we see all these times, toss, before they go to break, we see Velveteen Dream like backstage 
on his couch waiting. You're telling me all those shots with him on the couch and nobody rolls it on the stage with him like he's done before. He's on the podium, he's doing this speech toward Adam Cole, he says you're still at home playing video games and he, he puts him over as uh, the, arguably the greatest NXT champion of all time, but inevitably it will be dream over. As he's talking, we see Finn Balor just kind of like pop into frame. He's, he, he snuck in there and he's blocked in, uh, in the, from the shot by dream. Camera steps over to the left and you see Finn Balor there. So Finn takes umbrage to uh, uh, Dream's comments about Cole arguably being the greatest NXT champion and so then Dream makes a challenge to Finn for next week. I'm really excited for that one. Bivens Enterprises with a promo backstage. Malcolm Bivens uh, does a preemptive congratulations to whoever wins the tag title match on this night and saying whoever wins uh, that Rinku and Sarav are going to be the next NXT tag team champions. We then get a bit of a rundown of some of the matches for next week's NXT including the uh, Cruiserweight title tournament matches including one with Drake Maverick and Jake Atlas and they say Single out Drake on commentary saying he undoubtedly has a lot to prove, you think? In the main event, the Broserweights are set to defend the Tag Team Championships against the Undisputed Era, but of course Pete Dunne unable to make it to America these days due to the uncertain times, so who will the interim replacement be? It's Timothy Thatcher making his on-air debut with NXT. Uh, he's referred to on commentary as the meanest son of a bitch you'll ever see, which is a hell of an endorsement, and I am extremely happy to see Thatcher on my TV. I first met him, uh, forgive me for uh, indulging and you know, name-dropping a bit here, but I met him way back in 2006. We were both on our first year in wrestling. We were working in Portland, not against each other by any means, but we were in the same locker room together. And, you know, I, we reconnected when uh, I was in, we moved to Reno and he was working in Northern California and Nevada. Uh, I even actually managed him in a tag team match for like one time in Reno uh, several years ago. So yeah, it, I was really happy to see Thatcher here. I know he's been on the radar by WWE for a very long time, but kind of electing to not sign just yet because he wanted to do all this other stuff, going working all over the world, which he did that in WXW and Japan and all this stuff, forming ring comp with Walter. And so to see him here at NXT is it's really cool to see. During the match, we see Dexter Loomis in the shadows looking real creepy. What are they foreshadowing with that one? This is a real fun match, very hard hitting stuff. If you're familiar with any of these guys, you know what you're gonna get here. It ends when Thatcher, uh, the hero of this matchup, he makes Roderick tap out with the arm bar for the Broserweights to win and retain the championships. It was a good match, a good main event, made even better for me personally, seeing Timothy Thatcher are getting involved. And then the show finally ends with a shot of Tommaso Ciampa backstage and they've been building all night to this. Was, was Ciampa going to be a man of his word and finally admit that Gargano was the better man for winning their match last week? And so very reluctantly so, Ciampa does admit Gargano was the better man and then right after he says that, he's jumped from behind by some mystery assailant. Camera gets knocked over. We hear all this banging and crashing. Finally, we see Ciampa laid out on the floor and joining him is Killer Cross, the guy we saw a very brief glimpse of in that car at the end of the match last week with Champa and Gargano. He's finally here. He says TikTok. We see a pair of boots, uh, lady boots. It's Scarlett Bordeaux, clearly, and that's how the show ends. So yeah, really great entrance, uh, official debut for Killer Cross here after all the very cryptic videos we saw in the weeks leading up to this, and just a great way to end the show. AEW opens up with a pair of promos, one from Jake Roberts putting over Lance Archer and how the TNT Championship will bring him one step closer to what he really wants. And then we get a great babyface package from Colt Cabana as we go to that uh, TNT Championship tournament match right now between the two of them. Colt having some good moments to shine early on, but it's mostly a Lance Archer match. He's just too, st he's too tough, he's too strong. This match is far more competitive than say, the match Archer had with Marco Stunt a few weeks ago, but that was just more to show off the scary strength that Archer possesses. Possesses. And this one was more of a test to see how he could do in a more balanced match. And I think Colt's a great opponent for that. Archer wins the blackout and advances in the tournament. Great opening match. Dr. Britt Baker is in the dentist's office with a promo on how to be a good role model. And then we see a segment where Taz breaks down Jake Hager's fighting techniques, building up to the empty arena match for later in the night. Then we see Britt Baker in action against Cassandra Golden. Uh, it's a squash match with a dash of brutality thrown in at the end when she gets Cassandra, uh, her teeth wedged into the bottom rope, and she stops are very similar to what you did with Yuka Sakazaki several weeks ago. Uh, no blood and no falling teeth this time though, but Baker does win the match. This is a real fun segment next, the Bubbly Bunch. It was basically just the members of the inner circle talking trash about the elite and trying to you know build more hype eventually for the blood and guts match. And they're just like in their own elements, they're all in their house, like just doing promos, uh, pretending to talk on their cell phones and everything. And the way they cut back and forth between like Proud and Powerful and Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager with his kids and Chris Jericho with all his dogs and he's 
he's trying to make like a, he's like flipping eggs. He's using a metal spatula on like a nonstick pan. What's he doing? He's got the orange juice he's spilling everywhere. And then the exclamation point at the end where he switches over to his assistant and yells for more toilet paper. He can't get any toilet paper. It was pretty damn funny. Uh, you need to watch the whole thing because my retelling of it's not, not in any way doing it justice. Then we see Sammy Guevara in action against Suge D, AKA Pineapple Pete, as Chris Jericho repeatedly calls him on commentary here. Uh, Suge D, the former Sugar Dunkerton, he's an American born wrestler, but he's been making waves in the UK last couple of years. Also appeared in Impact last year as well. This match was okay. It felt a bit slow for a Sammy Guevara match, but nevertheless, uh, he wins with a torture rack into a big knee to the face. Afterward, he gets on the microphone and he's gonna beat the hell out of Darby Allen. He says he wants to make his point by beating up Suge D some more, but then Allen shows up, chases him off, and those two are going to have a match, a return match, as it were, in the TNT Championship Tournament, and if it's anything like the, way they had, the kind of match they had at Revolution, I'm very excited for it. Chuck Taylor of the Best Friends taking on Kip Sabian. I really enjoyed this match. Some good athleticism, a good story. In the end, though, Orange Cassidy gets involved on the apron, and then Jimmy Havoc, who's sitting in the sparse crowd, he yanks Orange off the apron, and he plants him with a DDT on the floor. Then when the referee is distracted, Penelope Ford hits a Hurricane Rana onto Taylor, which allows Sabian to pin and win. So I'm really curious what they're doing with this because then we see Havoc leaving with Ford and Sabian. It's not just some like one-off thing. Like, he's leaving with them, which seems to me it's implying they're going to have some uh, kind of business partnership, which it, it, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if that works on that level because I could see Havoc being this kind of like unstable, ultra-violent kind of muscle for Sabian. He's not like a big body, really kind of bodyguard type. He's not a large man, but I think his style makes him very unpredictable. I think it'd be kind of, I, I, I'd be curious to see how he would play off Kip Sabian and Penelope Ford if they're going to really go forward with that as kind of like a, a, a pairing. Sean Spears, who lost the championship tournament match to Cody last week, but he got his heat back against Billy Gunn on Dark the previous night, taking on Justin Law, local talent here. He does not take his opponent, Justin, very seriously. Doesn't even take his shirt off for the matchup, but it almost comes back to bite him. In the end, though, Sean wins with the C4. In your main event, it's the empty arena match for the AEW championship. They've been building this thing up for weeks now as John Moxley defends against Jake Hager of the Inner Circle. All night, we've been seeing little snippets of footage from uh, other wrestlers and MMA personalities and comedian Ron Funches, all giving their picks and predictions for who's going to win this matchup here. This was filmed at Daly's Place several weeks ago, and Jim Ross doing solo commentary for the matchup. I think he did really well here in the solo environment, by the way. Lots of grappling, turning into punching, and then it makes the way to the outside of the ring. And a great call by JR. Why do we need security railings when there's nobody here? Uh, they're outside the ring for a little bit, kind of on the concrete uh, walkway areas. Back into the ring they go. It's a very good no-holds-barred brawly type match. But would you say it's a good like empty arena match? Hard to say because I think that, you know, what makes it an empty arena match to me is how well you explore the space and really get out there. We saw a little bit of that in this one. Like at one point, Moxie's got Hager and a figure four wrapped around a railing, but like there's all this space you could work with and have fun with. And I just don't think they really capitalized on that. When every match right now is an empty arena match and you hype this up as by name, empty arena match, then you have to do something a little bit different, a little more outlandish, I think, to really capture that and to really uh, and to really uh, make it worth advertising as such. But anyway, it, by, besides that though, it was a really good brawl. In the end, Moxley, he kind of absorbs a low blow, but he throws his chair into Hager's face, hits the paradigm shift on the chair to win and retain. Uh, like I said, it was a great match, but if we're doing this empty arena match in a sea of empty arena matches, you gotta do more to make it a little more unique, in my opinion. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week. NXT or AEW Dynamite? This was a really hard one for me to pick this week to the point where I'm just gonna say F it and it's a tie. I think both shows entertained me in very different ways this week. I think in terms of story building and world building, I liked NXT a bit more. Like seeing Killer Cross's debut at the very end was cool. I popped big for Timothy Thatcher debuting on TV. Seeing Dexter Loomis kind of lurking in the shadows makes me go, huh, I wonder what they're gonna do with that. It makes me, uh, piques my interest for more stuff down the line. I think the AEW had some good stuff as well. I think that I was entertained by the, uh, the bubbly bunch and just Jericho on commentary in general. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. It's gold and really puts a smile on my face as the whole night goes on. I think that, uh, and also the empty arena match with Moxley and Hager, I think it was a really well done main event. I would have liked it if they explored the space a little more, but just looking at it on its own as a brawl and as like this match they've been hyping up for so long, I think they've both really shown here. So yeah, I think a point for both is the, is the pick for me. 
me this week. But let me know what you thought about NXT and AEW in the comments section below, and be sure to vote which show you thought was better by going to the iCard in the corner of your screen. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.